Will DEI, or Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, kill the CHIPS Act? Remember, the statute was signed into law by President Joe Biden to boost domestic research and manufacturing of semiconductors in the United States. At least one investment advisor is making the case that DEI is harmful to progress. The CHIPS Act contains 19 sections aimed at helping minority groups and many that prioritize working with what the act calls, quote, minority serving institutions. A section in the act says the Department of Commerce must work with minority owned businesses and increase the participation of economically disadvantaged individuals in the semiconductor workforce. The opinion advanced in an op-ed in The Hill. It says the ship makers are tired of being pawns on the CHIP Act's, quote, political games, such as ensuring that plenty of female construction workers are hired, removing degree requirements for certain roles, and setting, quote, diverse hiring slate policies. Well, that's a mouthful. Amber, I think it's interesting that this is being framed as, as DEI, Right. I think some DEI policies are good, right, to reverse some of what we've seen in racist admissions policies, seeing people discounted as candidates because of their racial background, because of where they grew up. But I also wouldn't want to listen to a bunch of white people making hip hop music. And I don't think I would watch the NBA if they didn't let every top athlete join it who are majority black. I think there are some cases where we look at any kind of stringent quota requirements and we say, well, well, is that fair? Does that help race division in America? And sometimes the answer is no. In this case, I look at what these corporations who were brought to the United States to produce these semiconductors, these chips, I look at what they did and they tried to bring in a bunch of Taiwanese workers instead of hiring American When I think about that in in terms of DEI, I think it's actually good they wanted to hire Americans by, you know, doing away with these Taiwanese workers so that they would keep their grants. It required them to spend more money. So they went with the Taiwanese workers because they were cheaper than American workers. They didn't have to train them up on how to make these chips. And so now they're like, well, we don't want to lose our CHIP Act grants. And so what we're going to do is, is we'll hire some people from the community now. I think hiring American is good. And it seems that that's really what this is about for me more than DEI. I do agree that they should be hiring American workers. That's really the whole point of the CHIPS Act is that not only do you move your manufacturing base here, but you help give people jobs. But I think where DEI becomes a sticking point in this bill is that there are so many requirements in terms of hiring that these companies, in addition to it being more expensive to hire American, which to me is not a good excuse, but they also really couldn't find enough people to fill these slots because it's not always a racism issue when you can't find enough people to work in a certain industry. Sometimes that's just down to individual choices. For example, we look at um, female construction workers, right? I don't think that less than two or fewer than 10 percent of uh, women are not are construction workers because there's massive gender discrimination in the construction industry, but it's more that most women don't want to work in construction. And so these companies came over to the U.S. thinking they'd be able to hire all of these American workers, I I assume, and then encounter all of these obstacles because they had to hire from certain racial or gender minority groups and simply couldn't find enough people to staff their warehouses. A lot of them are now actually choosing to build more plants in other countries and letting go of the CHIPS Act grants entirely because it's simply not sustainable for them to do business in the United States, which I think is a huge problem because right now we're facing a massive national security issue with the manufacturing of chips. About 90 percent of them are manufactured in Taiwan. There's some manufactured in Japan and China. China is, of course, looking to take total control of Taiwan in the next five years, maybe. And it's obviously not beneficial to the U.S. and our supply chain and our ability to make sure we're not being spied on to have our chips manufactured abroad. So it's really important, I think, with this specific industry to let go of some of these uh, requirements or these stipulations and just focus on hiring the best people and making sure that we can get these chips made here in America. That's absolutely right. Your point about working construction, I I don't want to work construction. I don't like getting dirty. I'm a girly girl. I think there are some women that like working construction and that's what they're all about. But there's a better way to approach this policy wise, legal wise. If I was running an Italian restaurant, I don't want to be in trouble because I hired all Italian chefs. I don't want to be required 
you know, to hire a Japanese chef to work at an Italian restaurant, let them do what they do. Unless they're an expert on Italian cooking and they love Italian culture, maybe you would hire them in that case. But I think what this comes to is we have to be sensible with how we ensure there isn't racial discrimination in workplaces and in corporations in America. We've got to get creative, I think, about how we deal with this issue in society. I would like to see maybe every company needs to keep a record of their applicants and their application materials so that they can really see is there discrimination in the workplace when there is a situation where maybe a woman isn't hired and she felt she was very qualified. Maybe she knows who was hired for the position she was in the running for and she feels there was discrimination. There should be some kind of penalty if she decides to sue for the company. And it, it should be a, a hefty one, maybe a, a tax burden that that corporation has to keep for the next five years until they resolve it. Something that that incentivizes them severely to abide by it. I think a lot of the DEI policies just don't effectively address the issue of racial discrimination. In some cases, you know, they protect folks against racial discrimination, but I think there's got to be something else going on here where it makes sense in the scenarios where, yes, the majority of the workforce is male. Does that mean we should have equal parts male and female? Maybe we need DEI kinds of policies that are about addressing discrimination where it happens. You can't find new applicants if they're just not in your pool and the law needs to adjust to reality. Yeah, and uh, just to give viewers some understanding of what is exactly in the CHIPS Act that is hamstringing these companies, there are 19 sections aimed at helping quote unquote minority groups, including one creating a chief diversity officer at the National Science Foundation and several prioritizing scientific cooperation with what it calls minority serving institutions. A section called Opportunity and Inclusion instructs the Department of Commerce to work with minority-owned businesses and make sure chip makers increase the participation of economically disadvantaged individuals in the semiconductor workforce. And I just have to think that there's probably not that many minority-owned businesses in the semiconductor industry. Um, and I don't, I doubt that that's that, that 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 is due to racial discrimination. Um, it just it doesn't really strike me as something that um, that the CHIPS Act should be involved in solving. And it's really bizarre. And I think to your point, you know, we do have anti-discrimination laws on the books. To be fair, it's difficult for people to get judgments in their favor because typically companies, if they are discriminating, will say that whatever candidate they didn't choose was because they didn't fit the culture of the company or didn't get along with the other employees who work there. And so it is really hard to prove um, cases of gender and racial discrimination. But I agree with you. I don't think the answer is is piling new regulations on people that, frankly, don't have any grounding in sense um, and just make it harder for businesses to uh, do what they need to do. And it's definitely a hindrance to bringing uh, manufacturing back to the U.S., even beyond the semiconductor industry. I want to bring more manufacturing back to the United States, and I definitely don't want companies to be dissuaded because they think that they're going to be saddled with all of these taxes, fees, and regulations um, that requires them to meet quotas, essentially. And it reminds me as well of uh, a lot of the misguided ways that colleges, universities, and corporations decided to try to tackle what they called unconscious bias by having these bias trainings. And they found that they weren't even effective when they made them mandatory because for people who were already predisposed to being biased, it actually just entrenched them further in their views because they had resentment towards the fact that they had to go to these trainings. And then for other people, it made them more conscious, conscious of bias in a way that was actually harmful because they started behaving differently towards employees that were of minority status. And it just seems like we constantly get these wrongheaded policies aimed at tackling this issue that end up making it worse. Yeah, I think, you know, I wanna see regulation in the direction of let's actually find relevant policies that make it so racial discrimination is very unlikely in the workplace and in hiring practice. I think we wanna see the kinds of regulation that prevent working people from falling victim to exploitation, whether they're being paid way less than the value of their labor's worth and corporations are profiting so much by keeping worker, workers struggling to make ends meet and in poor safety conditions. Those are good regulations. They should be pursuing policies like those. They should have prevented it ever becoming a reality that hundreds of Taiwanese workers would come to make semiconductors in America. That's what we were trying to get away from. We were trying to get away from these semiconductors being made 
overseas, shipping the workers in doesn't do much for American workers. It actually hurts them when you have other people, you know, coming for jobs that I think should have been American. So we need more regulations around that. That would have prevented these workers coming overseas from Taiwan in the first place. And instead, we wouldn't have this switch up. We would have American workers trained up by now making these semiconductors, and we would have had resolved a lot of the shortage that's making used cars so expensive for working people and new cars so expensive for working people due to the the demand that's now placed on used cars because they can't make the, news, the new cars. So you have people cost burdened that just need a vehicle to get to work, not to mention, you know, we're in a situation where we're seeing increasing unemployment and working people struggling in that way. We need these jobs in America. Yeah, and also just one final point, going back to the national security aspect of this, our government, I believe, before the CHIPS Act, and probably it still is, was getting all of its chips that it uses for defense and and uh, and national intelligence and all of these really sensitive industries from other countries, which just seems like it could be rife for um, other countries taking advantage of that and potentially installing some kind of tracking device, spyware, um, anything that could make it easier for them to g gain intelligence from the U.S.'s intellig intelligence apparatus, which is obviously hugely problematic. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be back with more Rising after this.